it's now my pleasure to introduce the Naked Scientists. They're going to take us on a whistle-stop tour of the world of waves, gases, and chemistry. They'll detonate bombs, they'll electrocute vegetables, they'll turn, out, they'll turn air into liquid, and they'll launch hydrogen-powered rockets. As part of this, those of you in the front row may get a little bit wet, so please do prepare yourselves um, for such. Now, in this talk, we want to hear a lot of noise we want a lot of interaction. This talk is definitely not for the faint-hearted. So without further ado, it's my pleasure to introduce the Naked Scientists. <laughs> Hello. Hello. Welcome to the Cambridge Science Festival. I'm Chris Smith, and let me introduce two fine colleagues from the Naked Scientists, Ben Valsler. And Dave Ansell. Now, I'm really sorry if anyone's disappointed that we aren't actually naked. <laughs> I can probably safely reassure you, you would be a lot more disappointed if we were. OK, so that please enjoy the next 45 minutes-ish. Please interrupt us, shout out questions, and get involved. We love that. <laughs> Let me introduce, first of all, our first experiment, which is all about light. Can we have the lights off, please? It's not working. Why isn't that working? Oh, typical. Hey. OK. What we've got here is two lights, but they're not actually giving out light which you can see. If you imagine all the colours of the rainbow, it goes from red, orange, yellow, green, blue, indigo and violet. But the end of that rainbow isn't anything to do with the world. It's not about physics. It's just about your eyes. Your eyes aren't good enough to see beyond it. These lights are giving out a color of light called ultraviolet beyond the violet in the spectrum. As you can see on Ben's arms, something interesting is happening when that hits his arms. You're not actually seeing his bones. <laughs> what we've actually done is we've taken a highlighter pen and we've drawn on his arm. And as you can see, this highlighter pen is converting this invisible ultraviolet light into light you can see, in this case, a bright yellow color. And it's really quite cute. You sometimes see them in discos and things like that. Discos. <laughs> <laughs> I get told off when I talk about clubs. It's been a long time since Dave's been to a nightclub. <laughs> now, one of the things about UV, of course, you do see them in nightclubs. They're used to great effect for looking flash at raves and that sort of thing. But ultraviolet light also comes from the sun. And when we get exposed to too much of it, it can be very damaging and lead to skin cancer. Dave? Now, what do you do if you want to avoid getting sunburn or get, getting skin cancer? Sun cream. sun cream. So this ought to stop the ultraviolet light getting to Ben's skin. So we'll test it on his arm. Now, if it blocks the UV, we should, it should stop the UV from getting to the highlighter, so it should stop glowing. Let's see what happens. Get a bit more on there. So it would seem that sun cream works, which is kind of reassuring, I feel. There we go. You probably shouldn't use that much sun cream, but do make sure you reapply. <laughs> OK. Do you have the lights back up? So you can see if you look at Ben's arm that actually you can still see the highlighter pen underneath, demonstrating that it wasn't just blocking out all the light getting through, there are particles or chemicals in that sun cream that specifically block the ultraviolet part of light, and that's what's stopping it getting into the, into the ink and making it fluoresce. I thought that was pretty cool. I think they deserve a round of applause for that. OK, now the next thing I'm going to do is show you another way that we can give energy to things. We gave energy to the dye in that, ultraviolet, in that pen using ultraviolet light, but we can also put energy into things with the flame. This is a blowtorch. You can make creme brulee with it if you're into that kind of thing. But what I've done is to dissolve some common chemicals in alcohol and water, and I'm going to spray these through this flame. And what will happen is that the energy in the flame will go into the particles that come out of this liquid, and it will excite the atoms, and they will then soak up some of that energy and then give it out again. 
And this is the basis of a, a field called spectroscopy. So let's just give it a go. If we could have the lights off, please. See if anyone can guess what these particular chemicals are. What color is that? Any guesses what color it could, what, what chemical it could be? Indeed, it is. It's a solution of copper. We have another chemical here to try. See what color this one is. This is all very Harry Potter, I think. It means it's a red color. And this is a salt of a metal called strontium. I wouldn't advise you to put strontium on your chips. It's actually quite poisonous. <laughs> um, See so if you can guess what this one is. And I think you probably may have put this one on your dinner. Sodium. That's right, it's orange and it's sodium. Now what's actually going on here is that the atoms are getting energy from the flame and this is making the atoms excited and specifically the electrons around the atoms excited and when they soak up that energy they have to give it out again and every single chemical on earth gives out energy at a specific wavelength or frequency and that's why you see different colours with different chemicals and we can use this technique to identify what is in various things. So we know, for instance, what is in the sun, because without actually going to the sun, we can just look at the light coming from the sun, and we can see these different colors, and this tells us what the chemical composition of the sun is, which is really clever. But what about if I asked you about a f an item that you might find in a hamburger? Ben. Okay. Can we have the lights back on? What we thought we would do is get you to work out what some of the substances in this. This is a gherkin, perfectly normal, innocent gherkin. Now we need some way of giving this gherkin some energy. Now we could put it in the flame, but that's kind of a bit boring, a bit passe. Chris has already done that. So I thought we would try electrocuting it. <laughs> so what I have here is essentially an electric chair for gherkins. <laughs> it's made up of two forks which I've slightly mutilated a couple, of, a couple of months ago, and they're wired up to the mains. Not quite at the moment, because otherwise I would be very worried about doing this bit. <laughs> Put them on the forks. Okay. Now, um, what I'm going to do in a moment is put full 240 volt mains electricity through this gherkin. Is it possible to put this on the camera by any chance so we can, we can see it on the screen? Can we see it on the screen? Oh. Possibly not. No? Oh, well. No. Oh, well. We'll carry on. You should be able to see. Okay. So we can dip the lights a bit. Oh, oh. it's coming up. Oh, it's warming up. Can we have the lights off, please? <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Okay. I can't see it. Oh, well. You'll well. see it. Okay, so... I'll Hang on, Dave, because it's warming up. It's oh, looking it's warming promising. Up. Oh, are we there? Yeah, it looks like we're there. Hold on, let's, let's find out. <laughs> yeah, we're there. Okay, hey. so we have a gherkin. Okay, I'm now going to attach mains electricity to this gherkin now. The gherkin slowly drying out around the fork. It's getting very hot, giving off lots of steam. And where it dries out, it doesn't conduct electricity anymore, and you get sparks. Those give the gherkin lots of energy. Now, what color are those sparks? Now, what chemical do you think might be in that gherkin? Vinegar. 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 What, what made a bright orange color earlier? Yeah. Sodium. Should we have another go? And if I look at the ingredients of these gherkins, it does include sodium chloride salt. So well done. We'd like to point out that this is not the best way to cook gherkins at home. <laughs> but once they've been pickled, you may as well just eat them raw. But of course, you may have seen that orange colour elsewhere. In fact, you might have seen it along pretty much every road in Cambridge. And that's because of sodium lamps. Now, these are the things that we use for street lights. And this works in a very similar way. It passes electricity through sodium in order to give out that orange light. And it's very, very efficient, because instead of giving out lots of different colors of light that we see as white, 
it just gives out that one colour, that one orange, and it uses very little electricity to light up the streets at night. So there you go, you could perhaps light the streets with gherkins. <laughs> But those around here in the room will probably know how bad the streets would smell <laughs> if we were to do that. And slowly the rest of you will enjoy that smell as well. It's actually really nice to be here in Cambridge because actually for these experiments we did this so that we could go to other countries. In fact, we've done this show and a variant of it in three different continents and three different countries so far. I've never come to Cambridge, which is our home. So it's great to actually be here and doing it for you today. And when we were in South Africa last year, I had a microwave on a table like this. And, and I made the mistake of saying, what's this? And of course, everyone shout out microwave. And this little girl in the front, when I said, and how's it work, looked at me like I was a complete idiot and said, well, you turn it on. <laughs> but one way of getting energy into things is with, with flames and electricity. But microwaves are energetic too. And a microwave is actually a form of light. And in the side of this microwave is something called a magnetron. And this turns electrical energy into a microwave, a form of light. And the light wave goes across the microwave, bounces off the far side, and comes back again, mapping onto itself. And it creates what's called a standing wave. But what that means, because a, a light wave is effectively a changing electromagnetic field, in other words, you've got a changing magnetic field, and because you have a changing magnetic field, you get a changing electric field, and this propagates. If you put something metal in a microwave, you can induce a very large electric field in that, in that metal object, and this will make a very large current flow. Has anyone ever done this by accident? <laughs> have you, hands up if you've ever put something you shouldn't have done by accident, of course, in the microwave. <laughs> so what happened? Big shower of sparks, isn't it? Very dangerous, isn't it? Should never do it, should you? <laughs> Shall we try? Yeah. Well, actually, what we're going to do is um, we're going we're to try it with, with this. Now, th these are our signature experiment, if you like. They're crisp packets, but they're silver. And the reason they're silver is because this is a plastic packet, but sandwiched between the layers of plastic is a very thin film of aluminium. It's there for freshness, to keep the food fresh. But the aluminium is, of course, metal. So if we put this in the microwave, what should happen is that the changing electromagnetic fields will make a very large current begin to flow backwards and forwards in that aluminium field. And as you know, when you pass electricity through metal, it gets hot. And what that does is pass the heat into the plastic, and if you ever put a crisp packet in the oven, it shrinks and changes shape, doesn't it? So what the crisp packet tries to do is to change shape really fast. And this effectively cracks or splits the metal foil. And as this surge of electricity is running through the foil, it suddenly hits a gap. And all the electricity piles up on itself, and it's forced to jump the gap and make sparks. So if we've got this right, I should be able to put this in the microwave, and we should see something. So let's have a go. So this is, um, this is a stunt microwave. No, I'm just joking. It's a cheap microwave, in other words. Uh, <laughs> So I was going to put the packet in here. Uh, and if I ask the, the camera to just focus on the inside of the microwave, and I've got my hand on the knob. If we could turn the lights down now, please. Thank you. And do you want to count me in? Oh, maybe not. <laughs> Tell you, we'll hire these technical people again. They're great, aren't they? <laughs> just joking. Are we in business? Yeah. OK, do you want to count me in? Three, Three two, two, one. It's pretty good, isn't it? <laughs> I'm not sure that this would taste too appetising, although if you've ever eaten at the Adam Brooks canteen, maybe you'd disagree. Do you want to try it again? OK, we'll try a different flavour of crisps, just to show that flavour isn't the uh, deciding factor. Both, all other flavours work too. Other crisps are available. <laughs> so this one is the real McCoy's. <laughs> OK, let's have the lights off, please. So, done to perfection. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you.
Now, that was something fairly undaring. You can probably, if you're careful, do that at home, but just don't touch the crisp bag afterwards because the melted plastic is molten and it could burn you. But here's something you probably should never do at home, but I'm going to do it anyway, <laughs> telling you not to do it, and put one of these. <laughs> Who knows what this is? <laughs> well, this is an environmental disaster, of course, because we're not allowed these anymore, are we? Because um, they, they use huge amounts of energy. They only turn a small proportion of it into light you can see. But how do they work? Well, the answer is on the end here, you've got some electrodes. And current passes through those electrodes. And there's a very thin filament inside made of tungsten. And the passage of electricity through the tungsten makes the tungsten glow because it heats it to about 2,000 degrees centigrade. And that glowing is the visible light you can see. And there's some heat too. But because there's metal in there, if we put this bulb in the microwave, we should be able to make a very large current flow in the filament. It will get excited and it will glow. But there's an added effect as well. Because what else is in this bulb? There's some gas in here, actually. Does anyone know what the gas is? That's right, there's some argon, an inert gas, to help cool the filament. Because argon's unreactive, it's a noble gas. And just like a neon sign, you've seen a neon sign, the writing in lights, argon is in the same family of the periodic table as neon. So it glows in the same way neon does. So if I put this, this light bulb in the microwave, this bulb says it's 60 watts. So we're going to put a kilowatt through a 60 watt light bulb. <laughs> Shall we have a go? Yeah. OK, can, can we have the lights down, please? Can we turn that one off, please, on the camera? Thank you. OK, here we go. Ready? Do you want to count me in? Three, Three two, two, one. I only do it for a very short time because it is possible to make the light bulb physically melt and explode if you do that for any longer than about 15 seconds. And, and as I've found out, my wife has killed me for, because I did this at home, it does actually damage your microwave if you're not careful. So, uh, <laughs> and, and my wife is more dangerous than the microwave, I tell you. So, <laughs> thank you. Be careful if you ever do that. Okay. Now, one thing that you may or may not have heard about, and it almost sounds a bit silly, is that the American military, amongst a few others, are actually looking at using microwave energy as a weapon to try and clear crowds. Now, the idea is that they don't actually cook people. <laughs> that, obviously, would be unethical, and the American government wouldn't dream of doing anything unethical. <laughs> but, <laughs> but it can make you uncomfortably warm, make you a bit fidgety, and so if there is a big crowd, if they're being troublesome, it can make them disperse. Now, cook them a little bit, basically. <laughs> cook them a little bit. We figured that we would try and come up with something else, another type of weapon for clearing crowds made not with a microwave, but with something else you find in your house, a vacuum cleaner. <laughs> now this is admittedly quite a fancy looking vacuum cleaner, <laughs> but a vacuum cleaner nonetheless. You know how these work. They suck and you put something on the end of there, usually a, a head that or go into corners or something like that, and you use it to suck up all of the dust, which goes into a bag in here. Now, I've taken the bag out of there because uh, it works a bit better when we do this. What we've put on the end of our vacuum cleaner is a bit of plumbing. Now, that obviously isn't going to work very well at the moment because you're trying to suck dust in, but there's other stuff coming in from this way, and you'll get bits of cat hair stuck in... And it won't work very well at all because this is actually designed for going under your sink. We even have more plumbing to go in it as well. Now this is getting increasingly less like a vacuum cleaner. There we are. What this is now is a bazooka. <laughs> I don't even know how to switch this on. There we go. When the vacuum cleaner is on, the pressure in this tube, the air pressure, will be lower 
than the pressure around the tube because it's pulling air through. Now that means that the higher pressure air around it is going to push in through these holes. So it'll push in through there and it'll push in through there. But if we block this hole, then all of that air pressure is only pushing in through that end. But what if we then put what we have, uh, we call it a sort of safe sausage. Uh, it, just in case anybody gets anywhere near this, it is very soft, contains blue tack and bubble wrap and other pleasant soft stationary items. But there will be air pressure behind that projectile, which will push it along the tube. Because the air can't get in here, it should push it all the way along here. Now, what do you think will happen to that projectile when it gets to this end? There's a few mumbled ideas. Nobody's truly confident, are they? What do you think will happen? Someone shout out. Well, a few different ideas. Somebody said it will get stuck. Might do. Um, Some say it's getting sucked down the tube. Yep. Yeah, Might do. quite a tight corner. But let's see what actually happens. So remember, air pressure pushing the projectile. The air pressure can't go this way. It's going to go along this tube, and then we'll see what happens it's now. Your, it's your opportunity to shoot me. <laughs> OK. Yep. Yeah. Okay. Turn it on. You ready? Three, three, two, one. <laughs> one more. <laughs> so when it gets to this end, it's already moving so quickly, having been pushed by the weight of the air along the tube, that it actually shoots past this bit. And because there's only this much tube at this end, it only gets sucked back a little tiny bit. So it ends up with lots of momentum going that way, and it heads off, and I can shoot my boss. <laughs> One more. Yeah. Okay, so we turn it on, and we block this end. And three, two, one. <laughs> and that is how you turn a vacuum cleaner into a bazooka. Now, can anyone tell me what the vast majority of this room is full of? Don't say people. Air. Air. And what's it made of? <laughs> yeah, Careful it's thing. a mixture of gases. And about one part in five is the stuff we need. Oxygen, because without oxygen, we asphyxiate. But four-fifths of the air, four-fifths, 80% of every breath you take, is the gas nitrogen. And I've actually got some here, because in this container, I have got some nitrogen, which we have turned into a liquid. This is at about minus 200 degrees C. So I'm going to try to get some out. I might struggle, actually. Can we get the um, projector on? So, would you mind refilling? Mm -hmm. So what I've got in this cup is a liquid, which is liquid nitrogen. So if you take the air in the room and squeeze it down into a very small space and take all the heat away, it will condense into a liquid, which you see in front of you. And this is actually boiling in the same way as your kettle would boil in your kitchen at 100 degrees C. This is boiling at minus 200 degrees C. If I put my hand in there, it would very quickly, within seconds, turn to solid ice. And if I hit it with a hammer, I could smash my fingers into a million pieces. I'm not going to suggest we try that. <laughs> but actually, it's quite funny, because in Scandinavia, there's a company which have decided that one answer to the environmentally friendly fuel, uh, funeral is to put people into liquid nitrogen when they're dead, obviously, and then <laughs> blast them to death with sound waves, ultrasound. And this fragments you into millions of tiny pieces, which you can then scatter in the same way as you could if someone had been cremated. The difference is, if, you, if you're cremated, it takes about seven gallons of diesel equivalent to cremate someone. So the, this is viewed as a slightly more energy, uh, or a slightly more environmentally friendly alternative. But with something this cold, and if I blow into here, you can see that's water vapor. It means that we can take energy away from things very, very efficiently and very, very quickly. So if I take these rather nice flowers, which Ben gave to me this morning, I love you too, Ben, it's lovely. <laughs> If I put these in, we'll see what flowers look like at minus about 200 degrees. So all that steam came off because that's the 
energy in the flowers being taken away as the nitrogen boils. And now we've got flowers which are beautiful but very, very cold. Well, watch this. That's why I was unkeen to put my hand in there. <laughs> Should we do it again? Okay. So it's just freezing the flower. So the flower was floppy, and now it's not. And the reason for that is that all of the proteins that make up the tissue of the flower are normally long chains of molecules which have energy. And these chains of molecules can wriggle around and slip past each other very easily, which makes them wiggly. But if you s make them very, very cold, they stop moving very fast, and they can't slip past each other very easily. And that's what makes the whole thing very brittle. Not so pretty now, which is it? Anyone fancy doing the washing up? Who likes doing the washing up? Yeah. Oh, I bet. Yeah. This is a rubber glove, and it's really stretchy. And the reason it's stretchy is because latex polymers, which are rubber, are long chains like snakes or chains of spaghetti. And at room temperature, when they're warm, they're vibrating and moving around very fast. And this means that if I stretch the rubber, these chains, which are wound up very, very tightly, can easily unwind and slip past each other very easily to make the rubber stretch. But if we take all the energy away from them with the cold liquid nitrogen, they'll slow down and stop. And as a result, it's much more difficult for them to slip past each other, and so the rubber glove should turn into the clothing equivalent of those flowers. Should we have a go? OK, here we go. So we'll put the glove into the liquid nitrogen, cool it down. There it is. Doesn't look much different, does it? Until you do this. <laughs> so. Not quite so useful now. <laughs> now, one, one other thing I wanted to demonstrate to you was uh, I've just got a balloon here, which is full of air, and. The, the balloon is inflated because I blew this up earlier. The air molecules in here have energy from the room. They are zipping around very, very fast. If this was full of helium, some of them would be moving at speeds of up to two kilometers a second. Very, very rapid movement. And that means that the molecules are continuously hitting the side of the balloon and pushing on it, pushing it outwards. And that's why the balloon is inflated. So if we take energy away from those molecules, we slow them down. And if we slow them down, they don't hit the side of the balloon so hard, so the balloon should go down. So let's find out. I've just got some more liquid nitrogen in this other bucket here. So if I put the balloon into this, we should see it shrink. And as a result, it's much smaller. Now, if you watch what happens, as it gets hot again and soaks up energy from the room, the gas speeds up, pushes on the side of the balloon much harder, and the balloon reinflates itself. OK, so now we can... <laughs> now we can use that principle with a, in a cunning little experiment, which you can do at home perfectly well. Now, this is a high-tech piece of scientific apparatus known as a bin bag. In fact, a particularly cheap bin bag. And this is a piece of high-tech kitchen apparatus known as a toaster. <laughs> In fact, it's a particularly cheap toaster. There's a theme running here. OK, anyone have any guess how much air, what weight of air is in this bag? Just shout out. 100 watts. 100 watts. Watt. Three, three grams? Three grams? 100 elephants? 100 elephants worth of air in that bag? So we've got a fairly wide range of guesses. About five grams? OK, I'll tell you the answer. It's actually about 50 grams of air, which air is actually heavier than you think. Each litre of air weighs about a gram. Each cubic metre of air weighs about a kilogram. So there's probably the best part of a tonne of air in this room. So air is heavier than you expect. OK, so if we make that air hotter, what's it going to do? It's going to expand. If it starts off full of air, will it all fit? Something's going to fall out. It's going to get less air in the bag. And so the bag and the air inside it's going to get lighter and lighter and lighter. And if you put something lighter than water in water, what happens? Floats. Floats. 
So, should we find out what happens if you put something lighter than air in air? Okay. Now, this is another piece of technical apparatus. This is years of development, and Dave's time spent in his lab has worked out that the best thing to do to protect a toaster from a plastic bag is shove a bit of cardboard on it. <laughs> Otherwise, you end up with plastic in the toaster, and plastic-flavoured toast is not good. <laughs> So the toaster is on, and that's heating up the air inside this bag. As we've just seen from the nitrogen, when air gets hotter, it gets bigger, takes up more space. So we can watch as the air inside this bag takes up more space, and some of it is going to spill out from underneath. So now there's less air here than there is in the same shape next to it. And this stuff next to it is going to have to go somewhere. It's going to go underneath it. Gently. <laughs> what have we just built? <laughs> a hot air balloon. This is exactly how hot air balloons work. <laughs> Except you don't use toasters. <laughs> You'd need a hell of a toaster, and the cable would be a right pain to drag around the countryside. It would take the whole fun out of it. OK, we've got one more little demo related to that. We're going to heat up some air in a slightly different way. Instead of using a toaster, we're going to make a fire. If Ben can get at the fuel. Don't have any fingernails. <laughs> ah, there we are. Right. This is normal lighter fuel that we're using. There's nothing unusual about this. You can buy this in many different news agents. So for Zippo lighters. And unsurprisingly, if you set fire to lighter fuel, it burns. Do I not get a round of applause? <laughs> <laughs> what direction are the flames going in? Up. That's because the air is very hot, it's expanded, and it's floating upwards. Now we're going to do something slightly odd. I'm going to put this little grill around the outside. So as the air is floating upwards, more air is coming in from the side to take its place. What I'm going to do is make that air coming in from the side spin. Can we drop the lights a bit, please? Lights down, please. Uh, there we go. If I stop it, it stops. Go the other way. It's really nice and warm here. <laughs> it's toasty. OK, can we have the lights up again quickly? Now, so what's happening is the air coming in from the sides is being forced to spin slowly by this grill. Now, bizarrely, this is very related to ice skating. Has anyone seen any ice skaters on TV recently? On the Winter Olympics? Have you ever seen them do those really fast spins? What they do is they spread their weight out. They sort of stick their bum out one way, they stick their leg out the other way, and spread their weight out a long way, and they start to spin slowly. And they pull all their weight into the middle, and they go really fast. Yeah? And exactly the same thing is happening with this grill. The air on the outside is spinning slowly. And as it's being pulled into the center, it's spinning faster and faster. So you get this really, really beautiful spinning flame. Now, have you ever heard of a hurricane? Yeah. Same principle, but less fire. <laughs> you get some very hot water. You get hot air above it. That floats upwards, drags in air from the sides. But because it's... So hot, the water's so hot, it's dragging in so much air. Because the earth is spinning, that air which you're dragging in is spinning. So as it comes in, as it goes, spot, spins faster and faster and faster until it's moving fast enough to pick up a car and hurl it around the place. Scary things. Now, another reason why things can float is because they are less dense than air. And we showed you how to make a hot air balloon by making the air inside a balloon way less than the air around it, making it spread out and expand. Another way of doing this is to use a gas that's less dense. So this balloon and this balloon have got gases in them that are less dense than the air around them. Does anyone know what this gas might be? Yeah, 
it could be hydrogen or it could be helium. Now, unfortunately, helium is quite expensive, and I couldn't find any, so I had to fill it up with hydrogen. But it's floating, and the reason it's floating is because the hydrogen is pushing out of the way to fill the balloon more air than the hydrogen weighs itself. So the balloon keeps on rising either until the string runs out or until the amount of air it's pushing out of the way weighs the same as the hydrogen and the balloon together do. And that's why balloons work. But one other thing about hydrogen, is, of course, is what? Yeah, it burns quite well. So I thought we'd have a go. Would anyone like me to try it? Um, I'm going to wear some ear defenders. Uh, you might want He's to put your fingers right in your ears. Um, what's going to happen, hopefully, is that I'm going to put a flame to this balloon, and hopefully the hydrogen will begin to mix with oxygen in the air, and it should go bang. You might just hear it. Just, take, just take doing this as a precaution. OK, do you want to count me in? Did anyone miss it? Anyone asleep now? <laughs> now what happened is that hydrogen mixed with oxygen from the air and hydrogen reacts with oxygen to make what? Water, yeah. So two hydrogen molecules, two H2O, mixes with one oxygen molecule, O2, and they react to make two molecules of water. But they also release enormous amounts of energy. And the reason you hear a nice big bang is because this energy heats the air around the site of explosion, and this causes the air to expand. But it does so very, very quickly, faster than it can actually get out of the way. And this creates a shock wave. And that's why you hear a thump. The problem is the reaction's quite slow, believe it or not, because the hydrogen's all in one place and the oxygen's in the air. And the two have to mix before they can react together. Can anyone think how you'd speed up the reaction? <laughs> well, the answer is you mix the two together. And it's very dangerous. <laughs> so that's what we've done. So uh, in this balloon, uh, I've got just the right amount of hydrogen and oxygen mixed together. So it should react faster. And that means that the shock wave we get should be a little bit faster and therefore a little bit more of a thump. So you might, if you missed the first one, you might hear this one if it works. You okay? really want to put your fingers in your ears for this one. <laughs> OK? Two. Should we count? Okay, so that's kind of impressive. I'll give it that. But not especially useful. Makes a lot of noise, but otherwise not very much. I'm going to try and use the same reaction to do something a little bit more useful. What I've got here is a lemonade bottle with a bit of hydrogen in it and quite a lot of air. Mix the right quantities. Roughly. Roughly. It's not really precision science, this one. <laughs> ben, if you've got lighter. Yeah. I'm going to put it down this tube. And the thing about um, lemonade bottles is they're actually very, very strong. So if we can create, cause a reaction to happen in here, all that gas, all that explosion, all that expansion of gas can, can only get out in one direction. So we're going to get lots and lots of gas going in one direction. Now, if you push something, it has to push you back. So if the bottle, which Isaac Newton worked out a few hundred years ago, so if the bottle is pushing lots of gas downwards, then the gas is going to push the bottle upwards. So, ready? Three, two, one. <laughs> what have I just built? A rocket. This is actually exactly how space rockets work. The space shuttle reacts hydrogen and oxygen. They actually get a lot more of it in a small space. Reacts hydrogen and oxygen together. They get very, very hot. They expand and pu push downwards really, really, gets pushed downwards really fast. That pushes the rocket upwards. 
Should I try it again? Yes. I can make the... Three, Three two... two. Now, earlier on, using the liquid nitrogen, if I'll do over here, using the liquid nitrogen, we showed you that when you put a balloon, it's normally full of air, and you make it very cold, it'll get smaller. Now, that's partly because it has less energy, so it takes up less space, but all of the different gases in air, if you get them cold enough... Can we have the projector on, please? Yeah, we'll need it for this. If you get them cold enough, they actually become a liquid. Now, if you look in the bottom of there... Now, I don't know if you can see that or not. It's looking good. If it you look good. in the bottom of there, you should see a bit of liquid air. Now, that's there's probably just, over, just about a teaspoon, just under a teaspoon, maybe, of, of liquid air in there. And it fairly quickly... As long as I keep it moving, the balloon doesn't break. Fairly quickly expands to become gaseous air again. And so that, just less than a teaspoon, actually takes up quite a lot of space. Now, that in itself is quite cool. It's quite nice to see that you can liquefy air so easily. But it's also the basis of our next experiment, for which you, once again, will probably need to put your fingers in your ears. You've got a while yet. Oh, go on. Just, just, don't just dip it out. OK. OK. I'm now going to do something which, in every safety manual, Involving liquid nitrogen, it tells you not to do. <laughs> That's why we're doing it. <laughs> what I'm going to do is I'm going to put a little bit of liquid nitrogen in a lemonade bottle. The lemonade bottles, as I was saying earlier, are very, very strong. And that's perfectly safe. There's nothing wrong with that. Then what I'm going to do is put the lid on. And the problem with that is liquid nitrogen, when it expands, as you saw that liquid gas, when it expanded, liquid air, when it expanded, it expanded about 600 times when it boils. So I don't have to put very much liquid nitrogen in this bottle to expand enough to fill up the bottle. In fact, I could put enough liquid nitrogen to fill this bottle 100 times in here, easily. So slowly, as this liquid nitrogen boils, it's going to produce more and more gas, and there's nowhere for that gas to go. So that gas is going to push harder and harder and harder on the bottle until something gives. And the thing about um, lemonade bottles is they're very, very strong. So nothing gives for a very long time. That's got a good amount of liquid nitrogen on, in there. I'm going to do it okay. in a bin round here so it's not too loud for you guys. No, you, you probably can't. Look, just to show you what we've got. There's a bin here. And this big sheet we're putting over the top. So sorry you guys can't see it. In fact, most of you can't see it. But we'll have the camera on it. And you should hear it, I expect. That's OK. Oh. Get out some air defenders. OK, so there is a dustbin around the back OK, there. so I'm going to put the lid on now. I'm going to cover it up. And then I'm going to retreat. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm going to give the camera a... <laughs> <laughs> And we should probably be able to find the remnants of the bottle, <laughs> which aren't especially big. <laughs> Thank you, guys. Well, that's pretty much our show. I'd like to say a very big thank you to two wonderful guys who work with me on The Naked Scientist, Dave Ansell and Ben Vausler. And incidentally, if you want to have some experiments you can try at home quite safely, we actually published a book called Crisp Packet Fireworks, which is out now. It's on sale. You can get it from Amazon. If you get it from the nakedscientist.com, you can actually get it cheaper than you can from the bookstore. So nakedscientist.com and have a look for Crisp Packet Fireworks. And you can get hold of a whole bunch of experiments you can do safely at home. Now, have you had enough? No!
Yeah, you people going out, you really regret leaving now, don't you? <laughs> yeah. Would you like one more experiment? Yes! Well, I think some people smell a bit. So I thought some of you could use a bath. So we bought this paddling pool. It's actually uh, magic of the rainbow. Very nice, isn't it? Um, but what we're going to do, what we've got, is a very large bin full of very hot water. And what we've dissolved in this very hot water is a whole bottle of bubble bath. And because we don't like wasting stuff on the naked scientists, and we've got a very large amount of liquid nitrogen left, <laughs> um, we thought we'd find out what happens if you put a very large amount of liquid nitrogen in the region of several litres into a full bin with a whole bottle of bubble bath dissolved in it. Now, um, as, uh, as we showed you with that bottle, when liquid nitrogen turns from a liquid into a gas, it expands by a factor of 600 times. So if I put two litres of liquid nitrogen in there, it will soak up all of the energy from the hot water and turn into 1,200 litres, okay, one and a half cubic metres of gas. And it will do that underneath bubbly fluid with a whole bottle of bubble bath dissolved in it. <laughs> but where are you going with my microwave? <laughs> Nowhere. Um, shall we have a go? Yeah. Now, I'm just going to do my lab coat up because, um, and, and I'm just going to adjust my trousers because um, I did this once before and it, it all went up my trouser leg. <laughs> I've got two children conceived beforehand, so uh, <laughs> probably all right. Okay, now we only have one go at doing this uh, because once the nitrogen's gone, it's gone. So we only have, you, there's no encore, I'm afraid. So this really is it. Sounds like Michael Jackson. This is it. Uh, so I'm going to pour the whole bucket into there and hopefully survive the experience and so will you people at the front. Okay? <laughs> Thank you very much for coming. I hope you've enjoyed our show and hopefully we'll see you again next year. Okay. Are you ready? Yes! Can we count down from three? Yes. Three, three, two, two. Thank you. Hey, let's hear it for the naked scientists. Come on, Cambridge, make some noise. <laughs>